but speaking of creating good experiences, that's what we're going to talk about today. But I can start. I do have slides. Um, you don't have to pay attention to them, but I think it does help sometimes for people to understand concepts if there's some backup material. So we'll look at these. And I work for the um, UPMC Technology Development Center, so I wanted to share a little bit about that. And so what we do is we try to make better technology for uh, people who use their services, most of the positions. Uh, and uh, you probably are familiar with UPMC. And we are hiring, so if you know anybody who works in user experience, we'd love to have people join us. So user experience. This is about making better experiences for people. How to make their experience at the library, for example, more engaging, more interesting, more fun. Primarily the work that I do is related to websites and mobile uh, experiences, so more of the visual experiences, but it can be applied to any type of experience. And so primarily we are all either in business or in nonprofits to create experiences. So to have uh, situations where people are engaged, they find that the experience is usable, that they are able to access it regardless of their ability, and that the experience is relevant, that they find the information they're looking for, and the content that they find, we are talking about content earlier, that it's, it's relevant to what they need, and it informs them, and they're more likely then to share that information, which, again, keeps whatever you're doing going. It, it's the, the idea of, of keeping us all uh, employed, basically. Um, so the functional aspects of user experience are really all about being effective, making sure that people can get done whatever it is that they're trying to do efficiently, making sure that it doesn't take them an extraordinary amount of time, that they're not waiting for that page to download, that they're not waiting for that image to show up, that things are parsed in a way that, that makes sense, that they're able to get to that content as quickly as possible. And then, of course, that they're able to learn the experience so that next time they come, they can get to whatever it is much faster than perhaps the first time or even that the first experience is extremely fast. Some of the newer apps are very nice in that they give that little preview of what and how you can use the app, and then you're ready to get. You don't even need any help. You can just jump right in and start using it. So from the user's perspective, this means, again, it's useful. It's uh, They feel like they're in control. So uh, when you gain those notifications, you feel like you can turn them off on your phone. So if you're getting a lot of Facebook notifications or something like that, but the user feels that they are in control, they're in control of privacy, they're in control of all of the pieces of the experience. experience. And that it's helping them, it's enhancing whatever skill it is that they want to learn perhaps, it's enhancing their ability to enjoy themselves, they're able to find the park and find the path in the park that they want to take on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And turning that experience from satisfied to delightful is really one of the best things you can do. When people come away from that website when they finish using that app and they're like, yes, I was able to do exactly what I need to do and now I can go do the other thing I need to do. That, that is a great user experience. So you can imagine that a great user experience can lead to increased usefulness, of course, of whatever it is they're using. The efficiency can be increased and in some cases that can actually be real money. So for example, if you're in a situation where many hundreds of people need to do the same task repeatedly, if you save just a few keystrokes potentially or a few seconds of their time, you can save you know, thousands, millions of dollars depending on the situation. And so that can turn into uh, a lot more money. And then uh, productivity in general. They can do their work faster and get on to the more interesting work. I always give the example of putting in an expense report if you've ever had to turn one of those in. Usually it's an onerous process. It takes a huge amount of effort. You have to collect all your seats. You have to add them up. You have to itemize and all that. If, if we make that easier for people, that saves a huge amount of time, and then they're not being paid or they're not volunteering to fill out expense reports. They're, they're supposed to be doing other stuff. So if we can make that easier, they'll be able to do what they are supposed to be doing um, instead. So as I'm sure you're aware, designing for everyone is impossible. We can't make everyone in, uh, for example, Point State Park or University, we can't make all the students here happy with the same experience. They're all very different people. They're coming from different life experiences. They're coming to the school for different reasons. So we need to figure out who it is that we're designing for and what their specific goals are. Who will use it? What What is it that they're trying to do? Um, and an example I use is the student situation. So you may have two different students here at the university. One is a returning student. He's had a full career. He really wants to take some more classes and change careers potentially or expand on his current career. And then you've got Connie, who's a, a four-year student. She is just trying to get through her first four years. 
she's not really sure what she's going to do when she graduates. She's saying, you know, business or something, and, and you know, she's just trying to get through it. And she just needs to get to class, get her grades, make sure she's keeping her scholarship. Very, very different goals for these two people, and different priorities in their lives. You can imagine Rick might have uh, children of his own that he's trying to help with different activities of their own. Connie is much more focused on school versus external activities, so they're going to have different goals when they come to, for example, the university's website, when they walk into the library, when they're, when they're doing these things. They have very different goals in life. Even if they're in the same class, they may have very different goals. So in user experience, our goal is really to identify what are the patterns here. Who is our user? If it's Connie, what are the patterns in her behavior and what are her needs? And if it's the other guy, what are his? And of course, we have to work in, in our constraints. We have cost, we have risk, there's the, the level of effort involved. If it's a huge level of effort and the, you know, the, the revenue or the um, return or the uh, enjoyment of that person is going to be relatively small, it's probably not worth it. On the other hand, if we could see huge rewards for doing a relatively small effort, by all means, we should be doing that. So today I'm going to be. Thank you for coming. Today I'm going to be uh, telling you about what these various methods are, including interviews and current sorting and usability testing. And all three of these are ways that you can actually get feedback from your users. Come on in. Come on in. There's plenty of seats. <laughs> Come on in. Um, I'm just really getting started. I was talking a little bit about what user experiences, and now I'm getting into the what we And so these three particular um, uh, methods really allow you to get that information about your user to figure out how you can improve whatever interface you're, you're developing for. So for interviews, they're pretty basic. I'm sure at least when you're looking for a job, you participate in an interview, if not actually interviewing people for what you do. And the goal is really to build on your hypothesis of whatever it is. So I have a theory that people need to do this, and I think they would want to do it in this way, whatever that is. So uh, finding a path in the park, or uh, looking for a, a grocery item on Amazon, whatever it is. You, you have a theory of how this probably works. So you're either going to build up on that theory because you'll find information that is actually helping you, or you're going to tear it down. And that's good. You want to fail early, fail often with your ideas, and you want to do this well before a developer has spent their time thinking through the solution. You want to do it before all that's happened. And so interviews are a great way to do that. And you can confirm their tasks, the user's tasks, their opinions, their attitudes, the problems that they're trying to solve, and how potentially you can approach those. And you can even, during an interview, show them some prototypes and ideas that you're looking at. And look at the existing technology that they're using. Maybe they're using a tool that's kind of halfway there and you can build on that. So there are different styles of doing interviews. There's structuring where you have a list of questions and you go through them. And if you're talking to seven people, all seven people will get mostly the same questions or maybe exactly the same questions as you talk to them and gather feedback. Another style is just open-ended. You ask a question that's very open-ended. Tell me about how you um, reconcile bills or something like that. Tell me about how you do this. And then they tell you. And then you can ask clarifying questions. So you, you mentioned that you, you give this form to Jenny. What does Jenny do with it? What's your, what's your idea about what happens to that? When do you get it back? How, tell me about that process, that sort of thing. And then you can do a combination. That's typically what I do. I typically come up with some questions I know I want to ask, but I start with very open questions. And then as I get going, some of these, you know, I want to make sure I get my questions answered, but I don't necessarily worry about if I'm getting them answered in the right order or if I'm getting them all answered. I may have some high priority questions and then some other questions. But I always prepare some questions because once in a while in an interview I find that the person that I've selected to talk to is not a talker. And so I need to, to really dig harder and, and uh, it's, it's just very helpful. So I use the script and it's a memory tool for me. If I get flustered, I have it there, I have my questions, I can keep going, I don't have to worry about, ah, what is the next question? I've got it written down. Um, and it also, again, makes sure that I hit all the points that I need to hit during the interview. And uh, it, again, it also gives you some consistency to make sure that you are asking all the questions of each participant that you're talking to, each of the users that you're talking to. And again, we, I talked about open-ended questions as well, but you're going to get the, the quality of answers.
answers that you put into the question. So if they're open, if they're unbiased, you're going to get that person's real experience. If you're leading the witness, so to speak, if you're, if you're giving them the answer, they may, depending on the situation, be a pleaser. And so they may just say, yeah, 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 I love that. And you're like, no, that, that's really not what we've heard from our users. You know, we're pretty sure no one likes this at all. But, but they're, they're trying to please you. They think that you created this. So, you know, I really want you to feel good about your life. And that's not, that's not what you're trying to do at all. Um, and the other thing about questions is using the participant's word, word. So I've had situations where I'm talking to people in a particular field, and they use a word that I've never heard before to refer to something. They call it the widget or the whatever it is. And so I start using that word when I'm talking to them, because that's their word. That's what they call it. Even if it's not proper, even if the CEO of the company I'm working for would have a fit if they heard people going with that, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to find out about their real experience. And in their experience, they call it the widget. I call it the widget, too. And that's very helpful in building rapport with that person and, and, uh, and helping to gain their trust for what you're doing. So as you're doing these interviews, if you can, go to where they are. Be in their office, look at the mess that they have, and collect artifacts. Uh, so this might be the post of that they've stuck to their screen to remind them of something that they have to do every time when they're logging into the system. This might be uh, noticing how they hold the phone that they're using. This might be um, looking just generally around the office if it's very noisy. You might want to report that, but there's a lot of distractions going on. I work in healthcare, and there's lots of distractions for doctors when they're out seeing patients. There's blinking and, and beeping things all over the place and all kinds of things that might distract them away from what they're doing. And so that needs to be taken into account when we're creating a um, application or, or a website. So I'd like you each to find a partner, and this is going to be tough. I think we'll just use the three of you. <laughs> we don't have to dance, do we? You do not have to dance. I just thought it was kind of funny. Uh, so, so I have a, a sample question, and I wanted us to discuss amongst ourselves what would be a better approach. So the question is, uh, and this would be you as an interviewer asking this question, do you regularly book your travel online to save money? So is there anything wrong with that question to begin with? Well, I book my travel online, it's not necessarily to save money. Okay. So there may be multiple reasons why a person would book their travel online. Okay. Great. Anything else? Well, with that, and just that it's easy to do. There, there may be other reasons for doing it. Anything else? Yeah, it's, it's just very, you know, leading them toward an answer, and then also it becomes, well, if they're not doing that, are you insulting them if they're not doing this to save money? Yeah, yeah, so there, there are lots of little, just little nuances that, that can can be inferred by the way you ask that question, mm -hmm. and things that you wouldn't even think about necessarily, like offending them, potentially, that's a great point, because they're not doing this online. Like, no, I've called AAA, I've called AAA for 20 years, why would I not call AAA? That might be how they do things, but now that you're asking this, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I do that, sure. And they're doing it wrong. Right. What? Yeah. You know, what's wrong with me? That sort of thing. So, so these are some op, uh, alternatives. These are not necessarily the right questions to ask, but these are some alternatives. So, how often do you travel? Just opening it up to find out. Like, does this person travel? Like, they may say they only travel twice a year, and then you say, you know, thanks. I, you know, I really appreciate your time today. Have a great day. Have you ever taken one of those online surveys where you ask answer like two questions, and then like thank you, and you're like, that's it. But you, you weren't the person they were looking for, and they, they don't want to waste your time. They, they, you know, they want to get through the questions, and there's no reason you should waste their time if they're not the person you're looking for. So asking that just ridiculously big question, even if you are 99% sure they're going to say the right thing, that opens them up. And then, then you can ask things like, what proportion of that do you put on the line? And they might say, yeah, I don't do it at all, or I do it all the time, or how else would I do it? it? There are all kinds of crazy responses you can get sometimes. And then why? You know, what are you trying to do, to, to your point? You know, it may not be to save money. It may be because it's easy. It may be because they want to see all their options. It may be because they don't know any other way to do it. So there are lots of different uh, things. And so the, the reason why I wanted to um, talk about this was because it, the other issue with that question was it was asking a bunch of different things at once. And the more you can break those questions apart and um, ask specific but open questions, the more information you're and the goal with the interviews from user experience point of view is really to have people tell you stories because you're going to get so many little details in those stories that can really help you to build a great experience. And you might even discover things 
that you just completely were unaware of. You might discover a new need that you could actually fulfill with the product. And, and all this goes along again with that feeling early. If you find out early that no, no one needs this, but they really need this, and we could build something that, that fixes that problem, that's a win. You did build something that's wasteful, and, and you've solved the problem. So I have one more activity question. Uh, this one is, uh, what are your thoughts about a new feature that allows you to instant message a travel agent with any questions as you book your travel? So what are some issues with that? Okay. Right. Very good. So it's, it's asking you to predict a little bit, right? Very good. Anything else? I feel like it's almost like the last one. Mm -hmm. It's asking a lot in one question. Like even just asking that question, like if I can't ask it in a breath, yeah. <laughs> how are they going to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions as you book your travel? Or if I just have questions? So there are a lot of assumptions, it's a very complex question, and it's asking them to, to uh, guess what they do. So here's, some, again, some alt alternates. Would you like to correspond with a travel agent while you're booking travel? That's more an attitude kind of question, and you know, it, it's harder for people to give you that information accurately. But they may say, yeah, you know, I've had a lot of trouble when I've been on Expedia, and I've had a question, and I don't know who to ask, the chat wasn't open for whatever reason. So they may, they may be able to talk about that. And then what are some ways you'd like to correspond with someone? So that gets to more the, the type or the way that they would want to, to communicate. Um, and again, the, the, the issue about predicting the future, people are horrible about telling you what, they, what they're going to do in the future. I mean, you can say, you know, Wednesday I am going to the mall. Something comes up and you don't go to the mall. I mean, how can you even, we can't even plan for next week typically. <laughs> We're not going to be able to tell you what our interaction is going to be. Yeah, you know, and by the time you build whatever it is, everything's changed. You can't, you know, you can't guess how people are going to ask, but you can based on what they've done in the past. So another question might be, tell me about how you communicated with someone about travel in the past. And those things that they've done in the past, they're much more likely to do again in the future. It, it, it's just we're humans. By nature, we do same things repeatedly. So that's something that you can really rely on. And that's why in job interviews, I mentioned job interviews earlier, they ask behavioral questions. They ask you, tell me about a time you blah, blah, blah. And when you respond and tell them about that, they are using that as a pattern because they know that that behavior, you freaked out and tried to hurt your, your coworker, eh, not such a good hire, you know, <laughs> perhaps we should not hire this individual. They're looking for those patterns and they want to know how you respond to stressful situations or whatever it is, very similar situations. So when you're when you're doing these asking these questions, these very nice open and open questions, you want to remain passive as much as possible. So that means your body language is passive, your face is, is passive, meaning that you're not going, yes, that's the right answer. Great job. Why would you say that? What's wrong with you? You're you're not responding in those ways. You're just passively taking notes if that's what you're doing, or if you're recording, you're just, you know, having a conversation and, and being polite, but not trying to get the answer that you even if they are saying exactly what you're hoping they would say. Um, so again, don't don't confirm or reject, and listen for their vocalization. Sometimes you can, especially if you're in person, you can tell when somebody's becoming uncomfortable, they're shifting in their seat, they don't want to make eye contact. There, there are all kinds of signals that humans give off typically to show that they're either engaged and excited or that they're nervous and, and very uncomfortable with the situation. And uh, ask them the questions and just let them talk. Try not to interrupt them, try to just be quiet and, and, and listen, and that will give you a lot of information. And if there's an uncomfortable silence, it's okay. That's the whole goal of this, is to just let them think. Give them time to think. Silence is gold. And it's really their, their, it's their time to think. So if they're being very quiet, it's not necessarily because they didn't understand your question. It's not because necessarily that they uh, don't know how to respond, they, they might just be forming that thought. Okay. Any questions? In sales, when you get to that point, the first person to speak loses. Exactly, and that's the game you're playing. You want them to lose, not in a bad way, but you want them to lose that, that situation. You want to almost force them, it's uncomfortable, but you want to force them to say the next thing because sometimes that's what they're really thinking 
and they don't want to say it. They're hoping you'll interrupt, and you don't want to interrupt. You want to to allow them to finish that thought. Any questions before we go on about interviews? It's a pretty basic idea. It's, you know, it's just about getting out there and doing, uh, making sure you're, you're just not leaving them. It's, it's just for this. So card sorting is a really fun activity. Literally, deck of cards and having people sort them. You can also do this with a bunch of online tools, which I'll talk about. And the idea of card sorting is to maximize the probability that people are actually going to be able to find the content. So this is especially helpful on websites and for mobile apps as well, where you're trying to organize a lot of information. If you have a very simple website or a very simple app, and it only does three things, and they're only you know, very minimal things, it's not so helpful. But anytime you're trying to organize a relatively large set of information or redesign a relatively complex site, that's when these uh, come in really handy. And so what, you, what you're doing here is figuring out how to categorize that information. In some cases, you're trying to figure out what to name the different pieces of information. And you're just trying to organize it in a way that will make sense to uh, the user. Something that, that in this image, uh, you can see there's, this is a shot from a grocery store. And there's a, in the one aisle, we have wine on one side, and then we have wine and beer on the other side of the aisle. And then, you know, they have wine, twice and beer, so which, where do you look? Now the grocery store it's pretty easy, you can look to the left and the right and figure it out, but what if on the website you've got things that mean similar things? And, and this is a great way to clarify what are people really looking for, how they organize the information. So the idea is that you either provide them with uh, groups of content, or you ask them to organize the information in the name of themselves. So in this example, you've got shoes, clothing, and accessories, and people are moving the items around to, into those groups. And that will show you, do they think of this as an accessory? Do they think of this as clothing? What, what do they call a jacket, for example? What is that to them? And that will help you to then organize the information on the website or wherever it is that you're looking in the grocery store. The benefits of this is it's so inexpensive. All you need to do is buy three by five debit cards, or you can do it online. Like I said, there are a lot of free services that let you do it online. So all you need really is a little bit of people's time, buy them a cup of coffee, and have them organize this information. And it can be done relatively quickly. As long as it's no more than 50 cards, most people can organize about 50 items in about half an hour. If it's, I, I never recommend more than 100 cards. 100 cards generally takes people closer to an hour, and that's exhausting. Like physically and mentally, they're just tired so of you're suggesting it. this for the content that you can identify as going to be on the yes. website. Yes. Yeah. You use this uh -huh. to help work out your determination. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you're making the users do the work for you. So, for example, that, that student example, if I was building a site for four-year students, I would only recruit people like Connie. I would not recruit anyone like the other gentleman. I would, I would recruit four-year students. And I would ask them to take this information just on a table or, or, again, on that website, either way, and have them organize the information. And then I can see patterns through the data. And I'll show you some images of how that's done. Uh, but the, the other thing you can do is it will help you to verify if you can have a correct audience. So if I've had studies before where we realize that this person doesn't even understand this content type. So either we've got the wrong label, which is very possible, or this, this person's just never going to look for this content anyway. This isn't something in their field. This isn't something they're interested in. So let's, let's take it out or, or move who we're talking to or something. Something has to change if, if, if the card sort is going well. So it's a really easy way, again, to get that early, early feedback. I, I think that doing something like that might also be first, anyway, done with the content provider mm -hmm. as to how they see the information that you sort it out, as opposed to the user who may not have a sense of that see some value afterwards to the user. But yeah. I think that something like that would be yeah. most, most useful done in your initial thinking of the site right. with your, your customer. Right, with the subject matter experts. And that, that can work really well in a lot of situations. So for example, again, in healthcare, like physicians know how to organize information about cancer, let's say. Like they know what the different families of cancer are, and lung is separate from uh, prostate cancer. They know all these things. But what I find a lot, especially in organizations, is they want to organize themselves by department. So then 
that falls apart pretty quickly if you have like an HR department and a department of sales and a department of blah blah blah. Nobody on the outside cares. Like they want to get to what they're looking for. So that that's where it's especially well, helpful. Especially when you were talking about patients in a new situation and this is all over the place as far as that. Right. You really want to know about is this or that. Right. And have it be coordinated around that. Right. Which Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a way that you can, a way that I also use card sorting is to just show that they're wrong. Like when I've had a client who's like, no, it has to be organized. Everyone knows how we're organized. You know, we've got these silos and everyone knows how we're organized. And then I do this with, you know, 10 or 15 people who use that service and they all don't match what, what the provider was, was presenting. I have a case. I can say, you know, we can do this with more people, but clearly, clearly, you were wrong. <laughs> you know, if we can keep doing this for a while longer, it's just going to cost you more money and more time. But, but I see a pattern here that does not match the pattern that you had, and and so that it's also a very nice tool for that. I actually ran into that with a client. Yeah. Where I wanted to organize their main menu and all the drop downs one way, uh -huh. they saw it as something completely different. It was a method they had been using. Five and nobody else was. Yeah. And this could have broken that roadblock right. a lot quicker. Yeah, and, and sometimes Yeah, and sometimes they're still gonna say, No, we're going it this way. Oh, but that's yeah, 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 yeah. But but, but this could be Yeah, yeah. And again, for a cup of coffee generally you can get people to participate. It's it's very low cost. Even if you're on shoestring budget, usually you can you can make this work. Um, and sometimes you just have to fit in on your lunch break or whatever, but you can still this is a type of thing that you can you can get this done. You may have to take some extra personal time to, to make it happen, but you can get it done. Yeah. Um, and you can do them open or close. So open with the question marks, that means that they sort the information and then they name it. You know, I think this is uh, clothing and this is accessories and this is blah. The, uh, the second way is that you name those groups and have them sort into those groups. So that's a way to confirm what you already expect. Whereas the other way is just to really explore how are they grouping. Uh, and sometimes you'll have people who just don't understand card sorting in general, I, and uh, and you'll see that they will group everything into like stuff I like and stuff I don't care about or something like that. You just you, you can try to redirect them if, if you've got time to you know can you start again and, and try to group them into topics and you know try to guide them a little bit more. And sometimes you have to just toss out that participant. I've had that almost every study I've ever done with card sorting, unless we were really really able to control who we were recruiting, I've almost always had one that I just had to toss because they just didn't get it. Uh, you know, in general, they didn't understand what the part of it was about. And you mentioned mm -hmm. online uh -huh. possibilities. Yeah. There's, but there's a big difference between having to look at the screen. Yes. And being able to spread out yes. how much you need. Yes. And you're missing that qualitative experience of seeing them do it and seeing them make a face when they look at the card and they're like, you miss a lot of that when you do it online, but you can get a lot more respondents much more quickly, and you can do people internationally potentially that way versus you're you're really much more confined to the people you can get face to face with. More I know that people that don't believe in libraries because it's but um, there's a big difference in the experience. So, uh, just briefly, you can make these cards. I recommend printing them out. My handwriting is horrible. If you have beautiful handwriting, you can handwrite them. Um, and just enough information to give them a hint, but not so much of you don't want paragraphs of information. Just the title and get them to, to sort it. And uh, as participants, six is probably good if they're all similar people. So, like I said, if you're doing it for your student, if they're all for your students, they all entered around the same time, they all have similar interests potentially, they're similar, and, and that will work. If you've got people, seniors and freshmen, and, and all these different areas of, of their progress through their studies as well as their interests in general, 
six people may not be enough. You may not see patterns at that point um, through the data. So, um, and as I said, about an hour for 50 items. Don't ever do more than, uh, yeah, it, you can actually 50 in half an hour sometimes, but no more than 100 ever. Yeah. Uh, you can do in groups, but you want to not let them cheat the sound. In a big room like this, you can probably do six sites at the same time. But would they be doing individually? Because oh, I see what you're saying. So you sometimes cross fertilization. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Can think of this. Yeah. You, you can do that. Um, it would depend on the situation. So in some cases, especially if it's something where two people would do this activity together anyway, for sure, do it with two people. If it's more of a very individual activity, that you're talking about, then then I'd probably say just one person. But it depends. You can have great conversations with people. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so you can shuffle them so that you get a little bit of uh, variety, and you don't have a risk of maybe everybody pick that top card and put it somewhere because it was a top card. And uh, talk to them about the solutions and, and why they came up with this organization and what it meant to them. I'm going to kind of go through this quick because we're running. Uh, so there are lots of issues. I'm going to put these slides up on SlideShare so you'll be able to sit and take a look at them later, too. So we will go straight into, oh, so this is a quick screenshot of the online type tools. And so it's just a drag and drop into groups. It's kind of like um, if you've used um, Trello, maybe, for um, organizing. It's an online system for organizing. It's really more for programming. But uh, it, basically the idea is a drag and drop, and then you get some automated um, Analysis. It's not great analysis, but it gives you a good idea. Like you can see, oh look, there's, everything's very dark here. That means a lot of people chose this as a grouping. And so you can see where there might be areas that are very obvious and easy, and then maybe there's some lighter green areas that you need to dig a little bit more and figure out what's going on there. So they're very nice um, tools. And this one is from a group called Optimal Workshop. Um, and it does the tool is called Optimal Sort. And they also make another tool called Tree Jack. That you um, to do more open or close studies, I'm sorry, more close studies. Usability testing. So this is getting people to take a look at whatever it is that you're doing. And this is specifically to measure, I was talking earlier about effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. You don't have to necessarily time these studies, but that's something you could do. So if you know, and, or if you think you've improved an interface significantly and you want to be able to tell that you did, you can do a before and after study and get that timing. And see, see if indeed you did improve it. I rarely test on time, though. It's almost always much more about the qualitative satisfaction, being able to complete the tasks, that sort of thing. But this is real people, so the students literally uh, doing real tasks. So giving them wireframes, giving them sketches, giving them napkins, giving them post it notes, or a website, whatever it is, and having them try to do these tasks using that interface, not guiding them. And, um, and not telling them how to do it. They, they test it out for you. And it's observing them doing that work. So again, you can do this on almost any interface interaction. And the idea, again, is just to watch them. I've done this in um, automotive retail settings where we watch people come in for uh, car maintenance, and we observe how they are talking to the person who's doing the maintenance, and we observe that whole experience. And that's a type of usability test. It's more of an observation than, than the usability test. But then we also, in that same setting, had them use an app to uh, look at their maintenance record and see how they, how, what they thought about that, if they're able to use it to look up their maintenance. So there are different things that you can do. And there's no wrong way to do this. The key is to get their feedback as early as possible. So again, you've heard of other forms of testing, I'm sure. This is not quality testing. So quality testing needs to happen you launch and this has nothing to do with truly seeing if the product works this is just seeing if it's going to be able to do what we expect it to do and what the user needs it to do this is not accessibility testing that's something else that you need to do as well uh, this is not system testing for you know to make sure it's working and this is not acceptance testing uh, frequently i've had people confuse acceptance testing with um, or user acceptance testing and sometimes called the usability testing not the same. Usually, user acceptance testing is actually the stakeholder saying that this is what we paid you to build, whereas usability testing is the user saying, that, yes, this is the interaction that I'm looking for, and this is working for me. So you don't have to have a lab. There are some labs here in town, and there are labs all over the, the world at this point. Um, but you don't have to use a lab. Labs are nice because they do have two-way mirrors, and so it's technically it's one way in that 
you are on the other side of the mirror. It's uh, similar to if you ever watch those cop uh, shows where the people stand behind glass and they're all the, you know, the witnesses or whoever it is. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's that guy. Same idea, except this time they're on the other side of the glass. And they're trying to use the mobile app or they're trying to use a computer and you're able to watch them and see how they're interacting with it. Um, and again, you can do this at any stage and you can do this in a conference room like this. You can do this in a copy shop. You can do it anywhere. So it doesn't matter um, what you're doing and when you're doing it. And it can be at any time in the stages of development again. It can be very, very early on. And you just put a note on the door and ask the people not to come in. It's pretty easy. And you can record. I highly recommend recording the session so that other people can see what happened. It's especially powerful if you will feel very strongly that the interface is not working well and other people feel like it was built right. They know exactly what the people want and this is exactly what it should be. And then you bring in the actual users and have them use it and they can't find it and they're brought to tears by the interaction. You don't want that, but I've seen it happen. <laughs> it's uh, It happens and we all know that. Somebody's trying to do something, they can't find a stupid button, they just they need to submit the form can't figure out how to do it. And so this, again, can be very powerful and allows you, instead of you arguing and arguing your point, you show them. And if you can get them to observe, that's when those usability labs come in handy. You get your stakeholders to the lab, in the room, watching and seeing this real human being suffering because of the de design is so bad. Have you noticed a difference between people who never used the site before who start, who start on the yep. proposal? versus people who yeah. use the other and now are asked to use something different. Right. Oftentimes can confuse them even though it's better. Yeah. 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 And there you're looking at learnability. So are they able to adapt to this new site okay? Is that working okay? Um, sometimes you wanna you wanna actually study a competitor site and see how much better it is. That might be another way to, to give an argument. Like, you know, you work for Lowe's and you show them the Home Depot site and they're able to do everything they need to do on the Home Depot site and they go to the Lowe's site and they can't get anything done. Not that that's a real life example. I don't know, but but that's one way that you can you can also build up your case. For example, if if, if the competitor sites are much easier to use. Um, so again, prototypes are great. There's so many apps out there now that let you build clickable prototypes in minutes, literally. Um, Balsamic. Uh, if you want to spend a little bit more money or a lot more money, I'm sure is a great tool for for building prototypes. Uh, there's um, Another one that's very popular right now, I can't think of the name, but, but even Photoshop, you can put wireframes together, very rough looking things like this, and you want it rough. If it's not developed yet, leave it rough. Use Comic Sans. I rarely say that, but for this, use Comic Sans. Make it ugly. That way, when they see it, they will respond much more than, they will respond in a much more constructive and critical way than they would if you showed them something beautiful. Because if you show me something beautiful and I can tell you spent a lot of time on this, I am not going to tear it apart. This poor lady has spent so much time on this, you know, I'm just not going to comment about the fact that it's, you know, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> and you don't want that. You want them to tear it apart and then you can take this, which you haven't spent a lot of time on, and tear it apart yourself and, and make something that's much better. So if you want to avoid those mistakes, in the testing itself by piloting the test. If they had simply laid out these letters and took a step back, perhaps they would have avoided that mistake. The same, <laughs> yeah, the same thing with the usability state. You want to run through it one time and just make sure that your questions make sense, that they're in a sensible order, that the, the whole way that you're going to say makes sense. You can also do A-B testing. So I mentioned competitive testing. You can also test two different versions. So maybe there's a big argument about what's the better navigation, what's the better layout, what's the better whatever. Test both of them like a taste test, same idea, except in this case you're showing them two different interfaces. Usually when I do this, I will either show one set of people one set, one interface and another set, another set, or I'll show one group of people uh, version A and then version B, and then the other group of people version B and then version A, just to try and mix it up a little bit. Think about your high school science class, how you had to do, uh, I can't remember what that's called, but you know, reversing it and, the, and the slip switching things so that you don't have too much learning effect and, and other things that can affect their their um, acceptance of the other one. So um, do this when a redesign is planned. That's a great time to do this, to really identify what's the critical issue that we have to address in this redesign. What is really killing our users and what do they really not care about? Do they comment about the color? If not, maybe the design aspect can wait a little while. 
if they really can't find this particular thing, but the development team says it's a huge amount of work, well, maybe we should get started on that. Yeah, so, so it really can help to, to set that up and to plan the work. Um, and then you can also test to see, generally, are we meeting our goals as a company with, with this experience. If you haven't read this yet, this is a great book, Steve Krug. He also uh, wrote Don't Make Me Think, an excellent book on uh, user experience and usability. The Rocket Surgeon Made Easy really describes a nice way of doing testing frequently, and, and it's just a great resource. So if you haven't read it, I recommend it. And try to set regular testing days. If, you've got, if you're in a business where you've got a website that you're managing, try to set up monthly, bi-weekly, however often you can. Set up regular testing so you can get that feedback as often as possible. Um, I really like this uh, quote by Jeff Goodfellow. It's, teams should stretch to get the work into the studies. So they, if you have these regular studies, people start to stretch to be able to get their work done so it gets tested so they get that feedback. I really want to see what the users think about this. That's a great way to drive production and development in general. So it's, it's, um, it can be very powerful for the whole department, the whole company. Um, and again, make little changes. Do what you can now. Don't change everything at once. Don't take on the redesign of the entire site. Generally, those projects fail. Do smaller projects and do more frequent additions so that you're not wasting time and energy. And uh, everybody has problems. <laughs> everybody has limited resources. We all know these stories, and they're all true. So really focus on fixing the big things. I'm talking about those big, big issues, and then make small changes. Don't try to fix everything. And uh, as much as you can, just prioritize, prioritize until it hurts. I like that quote a lot. Prioritize until it hurts. I can't remember who said it, but it's a great thing. Great thing. And then uh, Eric Reese, he's a big lean startup guy. Um, if you're not familiar with that whole movement, it's an interesting topic into itself. But the biggest way to fall is building something that no one wants. I think that is true. So I've got some uh, resources in here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead because we are just out of time. I want to make sure we have questions. Here's some books you can look at. Um, I recommend reading them and referring to them. I want to make sure we got time for questions. We've only got about 10 minutes. Any questions, comments? Your book is short. Yes, it is. It's a very easy, short read. It's a great book. He is an excellent, um, easy to read author. So, yeah. Ellen was about to take a picture so I can remember it. He said, It's on my desk. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a, it's a really good resource. The other one is too. Um, but this one specifically for usability testing is just really handy. The card sorting book here uh, is much thicker, much denser, much more for expert use. You can find a lot of stuff on the internet. You don't necessarily have to pick up the book, but if you really want to get into card sorting, it's a, it's a great resource. It's written by, um, what's her name? I can't read it there. Uh, Donna Spencer. Donna Spencer. Um, she is basically the, the queen of card sorting, um, and she has a lot of uh, things online that can be helpful too. Um, and then the other books as well. Are Yeah, these are from my company. Yep, they're, they're not really business cards. They're cards with my name right now. Oh, no, those aren't. Yeah. I'm looking at these out. We're hiring, as, as I said, <laughs> you know, the UX people. We're looking for experienced people right now, but. What do you think? Are you looking at I just joined a few weeks ago, and I don't have business cards yet. Thank you all for coming. And the, oh, I want to plug the UXPA. It's a user experience professionals association. It's a group for people who do user experience work, and there's a lot of resources. There's a body of knowledge for 